All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Joe Chapolis, Carmen Neidegger. It's uh, November 17th, 2023 with the Nicholson Library at Linfield University. Uh, thank you both, Joe and Carmen, for being here today. Uh, and the first Thanks question, for having us. first question to get you started is why wine? Uh, well, I mean, for me, it's, um, I mean, it's just an endlessly fascinating thing, right? I mean, there's just so much. You'll, I mean, you'll never really wrap your brain around all of it. And there's so many rabbit holes to go down and I mean, between varietals and techniques and growing regions and vineyards and, you know, and the process as well. Um, you know, get to play around in forklifts. That's always fun. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, for me, I think that it's always something that I've been fascinated with and taken more of the consumer journey. Following Joe, he's been the adventurous one, you know, in uh, you know selections from the wine stores and just what we, you know, started out drinking before we actually got into wine. And then, you know, for me, it's entrepreneurship. I've just always wanted to get into, you know, doing my own thing, whatever that would be. And it it took a little while to kind of figure that out. So, you know, once I noticed that. Joe sort of landed into his special purpose, his thing, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, it was pretty easy to see that, you know, I mean, we could take this thing that was a hobby and something that we both just loved to do in our personal lives and, and, and make it into uh, a career. And that's where we're at. Let's talk a little bit about life before wine. Carmen, let's start with you. Tell me about where you were born and raised. And I was born in, um, I'm from Lubeck, Maine, so easternmost town in the United States. Pretty rural, um, and I've sort of taken a journey towards the west coast. Um, but really, film production, uh, I had a 20-year career in film production in Salt Lake City before wine, um, costume department specifically. So. That's kind of not the typical journey into the wine scene at all. Um, but yeah, we were in Salt Lake, I and mean, that's where Joe and I met. Um, I moved there in 98, and we left in 2016. So in between all of that, I just plugged away at running departments for um, movies and TV shows and commercial styling. And we moved into wine kind of through wine clubs and just drinking and enjoying tasting. Tell me about that. It's an interesting profession, obviously. How did you find yourself doing that? I got into it when I, well, even in high school, but um, professionally probably when I was 18. And that just came from, you know, visiting my dad. He, was, he worked in transportation and film for many, many years. And so I'd go and visit him and, and intern uh, my summers away on film sets mm -hmm. and kind of fell in love with that. So tell me about some, maybe some notable projects from that time. Obviously it's a long career where there are yeah. memorable moments or things. Like I that. know. Um, I think one of my favorites and it was earlier on in that career was probably Way of the Gun. Um, Christopher McQuarrie is just an incredible writer uh, and director and the cast was you know, it was easy to be starstruck with uh, with some big names: um, Ryan Philippi, Tay Diggs, Juliette Lewis. So that was fun, and that's where I really got the bug and started learning how to how to work my way up. And Joe, tell us about your life before wine. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, you know, played soccer in high school and did that whole thing, and then uh, I was big into snowboarding, um, so I moved to Utah. Uh, to go to go to college, <laughs> um, and that mostly just involved snowboarding. Um, Weber State was the the closest university to uh, to a ski mountain that I could afford, um, so that was where I went. Um, and I went there, and, and initially I got into the photography photography program, and so you know I've kind of always enjoyed doing that, and then they told me I was gonna need to take fine arts classes, and I don't paint or sculpt. So, got out of that one pretty quick. Um, and this was, you know, back in the day when we had to use film cameras. Um, digital cameras were not, or were just coming into mm -hmm. thing, or they weren't any good. Um, so, you know, having access to a dark room was pretty key, but yeah, 
know, when sculpting came in the mix, I was like, I'm out. We're not doing that. Uh, so yeah, I got into, uh, they had a uh, program called Technical Sales, which as far as I remember, basically just groomed people to be pharmaceutical salesmen. So that really wasn't for me either. <laughs> uh, so we did that and then uh, basically moved um, from Ogden down to Salt Lake City and got into um, doing all kinds of stuff down there. I was selling snowboards for a long time and then started working for a graphic design agency um, and then got into like a commercial photography and film production company and did that for a little while. Uh, then I sold bicycles for years. Um, you know, just kind of like bouncing around and never really finding my spot. Mm -hmm. And then we found wine. How did you find each other? At a bar. <laughs> Exciting stories. We had a lot of mutual friends and, and stuff like that, so. Kind of how people meet people, or used to meet people, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> so tell me about the discovery of wine that obviously you, you both mentioned that not really coming from a wine background, not really pursuing wine in any meaningful way for a while. At what point did something become something that you were interested in or interested in pursuing more fully than just being a consumer? Yeah, I mean, it was something, I mean, never really on the table when we were growing up or when I was growing up. Um, and, you know, going through college, just mostly drinking beer and spirits and stuff like that. And, you know, I'd buy a bottle of wine when I was cooking dinner every once in a while. And um, oddly enough, I just thought about the other day, but it was like, you know, what was I even buying back then? And it was Italian wines, because um, that was stuff that was affordable. And I remember there was a run where all of the Spanish wines I bought were corked. It was the weirdest thing. So I would like stick with Italian wines, because I was like, oh, this bottle's 12 bucks. That's, 12 bucks seems like a lot of money to 24-year-old me. So let's uh, <laughs> work in a skateboard shop. So it's like, all right, let's stick with Italian wines. I know they're going to be good. Um, but yeah, I think that really hit after Carmen and I met, uh, her grandmother lived down in Solvang, um, so like Santa Barbara County. And there's a, so we went down to visit her for Thanksgiving and, you know, on the main street in Solvang, there's like all the little tasting rooms and stuff like that you can cruise into. So we ended up cruising into some of those and that was kind of the first time that, you know, I knew that Merlot and Cabernet and Pinot Noir were different grapes, but I didn't know what it meant, mm -hmm. right? And that was the first time like I got to taste all of these things side by side and be like, oh, wow, I, okay, this is a thing. Like, I, I get it, all right. And then, or then go to the next tasting room and it's like, here's Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, and they're from three different vineyards. It's like, whoa, okay, I can, I can get into this. Like, I can, this is something I can like dive into a little bit. And, uh, came back from that trip and it's like, you know, we're starting to, the gears are, are turning and, and starting to get kind of fired up about it. And then my mom had planned a trip to Napa. Like she doesn't drink wine. I don't know why she wanted to go to Napa, but she did. <laughs> so we're like, cool, we'll drive up to Salt Lake and meet you. And then we'll, you know, she got a hotel room. We spent a week cruising around Napa and Sonoma and like, that was it. You know, that's the first time like I actually got to like walk through a vineyard and walk through a winery and see how it all was done. And it's just like, all right, this is all that, this is all that matters now. This is what we're doing. So at that point, what was your next step? As you started to think about it in those terms, what were you thinking would be the outcome? Were you thinking you had to make wine or? No, well, I mean, in Salt Lake, there's not really much of an avenue for wine. I mean, there actually were at that time two wineries in town. Um, Evan Lewandowski was making wine there. Uh, and uh, there was another one that I, can't remember the name of, and both of them were just like trucking fruit back from California. Um, but they were doing it. And uh, so like the only really other option was, you know, get in with the distributor or, you know, get a job in a restaurant. Restaurants aren't really my thing. So I mean, no offense to restaurant people, but, um, but yeah, we looked at distributors and we actually started looking at properties in Sonoma and Napa and, and I mean, it was kind of a far-fetched idea, but like, that was so like, how far we, we were, we I, was, I was into it. And, and then we uh, found our way to Southern Oregon. Well, I have family out here. So we'd been 
coming to visit uh, Rogue Valley for years um, to visit my mom and my sister. And it all of a sudden clicked right about the time that, you know, I was starting to really be looking for another, something else. I was ready to get out of film. It had been too long. It was getting really brutal um, and <clears throat> needed to find something else, but I didn't know anything else because that's all, all I've done. And, and Joe, you know, wasn't in anything that he was really attached to or tied down to. Um, and it finally clicked, like, well, we could never really afford to go and get property and start up get into wine in Sonoma or Napa necessarily, but there's a whole wine scene going on down in the Rogue Valley. And we have family there and we loved the area and uh, we actually got married on my mom's property out there um, in 2015, 2015, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, so that started the wheels turning of, you know, well, maybe we could do the whole dream, which is some property and build a home and be closer to family and, and figure out, you know, maybe getting a little closer into the wine industry. Mm -hmm. But we still didn't have a real direction with that at the time. So before we get to that direction, I'm curious about, I'm always curious how people educate themselves about wine. Once you become passionate about it, what was the biggest way for like sort of self-education? Uh, how did you learn about wine and, and what did you want to learn about wine? Drinking. Yeah, tasting. I mean, we bought a lot of wine. Um, and, you know, the internet is a powerful tool. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that was kind of the thing of, of you know, just buying a, a ton of different stuff at the wine stores. And, I mean, you know, for as, as backwards as, let's just say, alcohol is in... Salt Lake City and Utah in general, the wine stores were really good. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of good stuff there. Um, so yeah, it was easy to kind of just drink our way through the wine store and, and, and figure it out. And then it's like, oh, what's, what's Barbaridosity? Uh, why, why does it taste like this? How do they make it? You know, where's, where's Osti? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean that was that was kind of the kind of the deal, and you know I had made friends with a couple of different um, distributors or guys who worked for distributors through um, through the bike shop that I was working at, and they were kind of pointing us in, in different directions as well. So we hosted two or three wine clubs as well. So yeah, we had well, tasting groups. Yeah, we'd, we'd get people in to really be able to taste through whole regions. And in that process, what did you find yourself drawn to? Italian. I mean it was. Pretty much always Italian. So I mean, like I, I do really enjoy most things. We don't. Yeah, we don't discriminate too much. We're pretty into all of it. But yeah, I mean, we definitely kind of lean towards the Italian stuff for sure. So as the Rogue Valley became something of a possibility, tell me about the process of of of, of getting there and of, of figuring out what you were going to do once you were there. Yeah. So we quit our jobs and. Sold our houses and moved up. And, uh, you know, my thought was like, in my head, I wanted to get into the production side of things, um, but I didn't have any experience. I didn't realize that a lot of people are cool with that. Um, but it was like, well, you know, I've got, I've been selling things since I was 16 years old. Like, I, I could get a job in a tasting room or a wine shop or something like that. So we'll start there. Um, and I went into uh, you know, one of our favorite spots when we would go and visit was Quaddy North. Um, so I went into the tasting room and to turn in a resume and talk to Darius, the tasting room manager at the time. He's like, yeah, I do too much here. So we're looking for a tasting room manager. You want to be it? I was like, yep. <laughs> so like off the street, resume in hand. And I'm like, well, I'll, cool, I'll set up an interview with Herb. And, and we'll get it going. And yeah, I walked right into a tasting room manager job, sight unseen. And and then Thanksgiving weekend, the busiest weekend of the year, you're like, you're up. <laughs> and like, and, and the only person in the tasting room on the busiest weekend of the year is like, all right, cool. So just like thrown straight to the wolves, right? Figure it out. What, how was it? 
it was great. I did that for three years um, and then, uh, you know, built their website and, you know, signed up a lot of wine club members and did a lot of graphic design for the company that, that Melanie wasn't doing. Um, uh, and then, you know, during harvests, her would bring me in to help in production. Um, so I started like right after harvest, the first, when I first started there. So then like harvest of 17, um, I had started in the winery uh, part time. So they bring me in for like three days of harvest and then uh, three days on the crush line and then three days in the tasting room and sometimes four days in the tasting room. It's harvest, you do what you gotta do, right? Um, and then after about two and a half, three years, um, they brought me into the winery full time into production, which is something that you know I wanted to, I wanted to do, and I just had way more fun with. Yeah. So tell me about your first harvest experience, your first production experience. It was great. I mean, you know, down there, I mean, we work with. I mean, it's exhausting because um, it goes for so long. I mean, we, and you know, at the, at Barrel 42, we, we're doing sparkling wines. So harvest basically starts in the middle of August and we're bringing in our last fruit, usually the first week of November. So it's like, and then you're managing fermentations all through November and then ideally you're pressed off in December. So really <clears throat> harvest is like, you know, a good three and a half months long. It's pretty, but, you know, like I said, I, I, you know, it's, it's fun, it's physical, it's mentally stimulating, so Was it what I really enjoyed it. Was it to be? Except for the earwigs, yeah. <laughs> I no didn't one, see no that one, one coming. <laughs> no one tells you about the earwigs. <laughs> Nobody would get in the wine if they knew about the earwigs. That's really true. Uh, and Carmen, what, what was your kind of parallel role here? What were you doing at this time? Man, I... I Coming out here, I didn't know what I was going to do. I wasn't convinced that I was going to get into wine. Um, I wasn't sure that we would. I mean, I knew that Joe would, would probably land in some sort of sales role and, and, and be great at it. I didn't know if I would like it. <laughs> um, I mean, the joke was, you know, Joe told me I could always pick pears if I could figure out what else I wanted to do. Um, so I just kind of came out blindly um, and but uh, always wanting to be you know, ever the serial entrepreneur um, so I started up a small uh, bath and body company called Bramble and Oak and so I made and sold flower mineral baths and goat milk soap and things like that um, and actually through that is a weird channel to how we started making wine <laughs> Um, through a connection with with uh, with the soap, I I guess I was doing a pretty decent job with my marketing and and sales on on social media. And uh, a woman Elsa, who is now a friend, um, found me and was I want some soap and and we hit it off and, and became friends. And she let me know that her and her husband had recently moved down from Portland and they purchased a, a small property on a vineyard and they broke the contract with the growers because they didn't want any sprays, they have animals and they have a child and, and they didn't know what to do with the fruit. <laughs> and I said, well, my husband works for a winery. And she said, oh, well, great. Maybe you can help me figure you know, out a place for this fruit to go. You know? uh, it was Riesling um, primarily and uh, pretty old vines and a little bit of Pinot Gris planted in the middle of it. So we started telling everybody like, hey, here's some fruit. Um, no, basically nobody wanted it. Um, <laughs> hard to get rid of Riesling, I suppose. And, uh, and the deal was also that uh, if you were going to take it, you also needed to harvest it and all that. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to act like the typical you know, grower situation. Um, so it was getting closer and closer and closer to harvest time. And she said, all the birds are going to get this fruit. I would really just like to work with somebody who, you know, wants to do something cool and do something with this fruit and give us some wine. And that same week, Joe had said, you know, someone in this valley really needs to make a good Riesling. And I said, well, if you want to make a, a good Riesling, I can get you fruit. Mm -hmm. So that started the conversation with, is that something we can do? Um, where do we make it? How do we do it? Um, 
I'll turn that over to you because that became the, the conversation with her. Well, we knew where to make it. Well, right, but we didn't but, know if we could well, <laughs> well, so make it in the facility. The conversation with Herb and Brian and Nicole was, you know, I was, I, what, do you guys want the Riesling? Um, and they were like, no, but why don't you just go pick it and, and make it? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Guess we'll give that a shot. Uh, so, you know, it was, we went up and picked a ton of Riesling and brought it in and got to the winery. And I was like, okay, cool, what do we do now? Well, you forklift it into the press. It's like, how do we work the forklift? <laughs> Okay, got it. How do we work the press? You know, no, okay, now it's pressed off. What do we do? It's like, okay, well, now you just uh, settle it and tank. It's okay, we're settled. What do we do now? And like, it was, you know, that was the step by step for, you know, the, the whole year and ended up with a pretty good, pretty good Riesling. So then it's like, okay, well, cool. We've got 60 cases of Riesling or 50, I think we, it was like 45 cases of Riesling. I was like, what the hell are we gonna do with 45 cases of Riesling? <laughs> I was like, I think, I think we might be able to sell this. Like it was, it was, a, it was a good wine. It's still a good wine. Um, and so we decided to jump through, jump through all the hoops and, you know, wade into the bureaucracy and designed the label, slapped it on the bottles and that was our first vintage, 2018. <clears throat> That's amazing. Tell me about coming up with the name and coming up with the brand. Uh, the name is a David Bowie song. Um, it's really as simple as that. You know, I mean, we were, you had a whole, I had a whole list of, of names and it was like, uh, this is not really working, this one's not really working, this one's not really working. And Sound and Vision, we thought, just sounded pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it all, kind of all ties back to, to Bowie. Yeah. I mean, I also look at it as a little bit, you know, the, the, the entire journey into wine where we are now is, has really just been keeping our eyes and ears open and saying yes to unique opportunities and just going with it. Good um, one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's clear who the entrepreneur is here. Um, so, so tell me about, so you, you've got, you've decided to try to sell, you have, you have this recently. So tell me about A, selling wine for the first time and B, or not for the first time, selling your own wine for the first time, and be deciding what comes next. So we released our 2018 Riesling. Uh, I mean, by the time we had navigated all of the TTB and OLCC stuff, it was, uh, we finally got all of our licensing sorted out in January of 2020. Released? We released our first wine February 2nd of 2020. And three weeks later, <laughs> we know what happened. <laughs> so that was that was interesting. Um, but yeah, we did a release event at um, uh, one of our friends owns right next door to, to the Quadi North, the old Quadi North tasting room. There's a little there's like a little bar, but she sells like art supplies, and then she has like an art gallery and stuff like that in there as well. And she let us like do a pop up um, pop up release there. Uh, so we did that, and we had a good turnout and sold a bunch of wine. Um, and then in, was that the summer of 2020 that we were doing stuff at our house? August. 2020. Oh, December? No, August of 2020 that we were doing stuff at our house. Yes. Great. Yeah, so then that summer, um, a couple of the other people that I work with, um, Kevin Brack and Sarah Gar, they have their own little uh, labels as well. Um, and Andy. And our friend Andy Meyer, who we partnered with in uh, the Catalyst Wine Collective in our tasting room. Um, you know, none of us had tasting rooms at the time. Um, none of us really had like a great outlet for our wine. So it's like, I mean, how do we how do we move this stuff? So I mean, we've got you know a, a pretty. We live on some property. We've got a, a big deck that overlooks the valley, and it's like, well, what if we just have people over and do tastings on the deck? It'll all be outside. It'd be great. So yeah, we had people come up to our house like on every weekend in August and, and you know. Private groups. Private groups and did cheese plates and, and you know, each of us poured one or two of our wines and sold a bunch of wine. Actually worked out pretty good. Uh, and then through that, 
we, you know, Andy and I and Rob Follin, um, I mean, you know, the wine industry down there is pretty small, so we're all kind of, we're all pretty chummy. Um, you know, we all have our own small brands, and it's like, okay, well, what if we all partnered up and opened an actual tasting space? Uh, and that's how Catalyst Wine Collective was born. So tell me about, obviously you're navigating this all during COVID and all of that, so tell me about sort of the, I guess, the, the, the gumption to go forward with it when there's a lot of uncertainty. What made you kind of keep pushing forward during that time? We had a bunch of wine to sell. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you know, it's, we found, uh, another part of it was we found what we felt was a really good location. Um, so, you know, kind of pushing ahead with that to make sure we actually got the space we wanted uh, was, was pretty important. Um, and yeah, and then from there we kind of just set about building the tasting room out and, and getting it going. And, you know, timing wise is like, we have to do it. I mean, yeah, and we didn't stop making wine. If anything, we, we went from, you know, 45 cases the first year to 150 cases the second year to 400 cases the third year. Uh, and it's, And I had always pictured Sound and Vision being more of on a direct sales sort of model rather than rather than wholesale or distribution. Um, I mean, now we're kind of getting to the point where we're going to need some wholesale and distribution. Yeah, it's 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 time. That's the next step. So before we talk about Catalyst, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, obviously, Riesling the first year. What what did you sort of foresee for varietal and sort of style going forward, and what were you able to kind of produce the second and the third year? Um, moving in the second year, we did, um, we ended up getting two tons of Riesling off of uh, that Riesling vineyard, the Eden's Vineyard. <clears throat> and then uh, we were able to get a ton of Merlot from uh, the Lane Vineyard and the Applegate. Uh, it's one of the oldest vineyards in Southern Oregon, planted in 73. Um, and these are, you know, 50 year old, own rooted Merlot vines. And that vineyard is incredible. I mean, you, you're in the middle of it and you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's, it's such a wild spot. Um, and to be able to work with, you know, old vine fruit like that was pretty much a no brainer for me. Um, and then the third year we were able to, to do, uh, well, that second year we also did, we got two tons of Riesling from that Riesling vineyard and we split it up into two lots and did a, a white wine and a skin contact Riesling. Um, that went over really well. And then the third year, we were able to bring on some Barbera um, from Celestina Vineyard, which is just up the road from our house in Talent. Um, all the usual suspects again. And then I was able to actually get Vermentino from the Lane Vineyard as well. And that was, that's Vermentino that's grafted onto 50 year old, formerly Merlot vines. Um, so 50 year old Vermentino at this point. That's pretty, pretty wild. So Carmen, I'm curious, uh, you, you mentioned not being sure about this as you came out here and kind of getting into wines more slowly. Tell me about sort of your role in this and how, and now that you are in it, how, how that came to be. I really like the building process of, you know, of, of a small business. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just kind of being along for the ride and, and seeing, you know, witnessing um, what Joe could do mm -hmm. and realizing that I think I think this is this is a good idea, you know. I mean, he, he's managed to make some pretty great wine, and it's only gotten better and better. Um, it just brought a lot of joy. I thought, you know, and, and selling wine is more fun than selling soap. I will say, um, <laughs> I like the hospitality side of it. I like uh, the events and the you know design and and the connection and sharing a space and all of those things. So as soon as it was on the table, you know, how do we move forward, especially in this odd environment of, you know, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And and we started working on this collective space. Uh, it All of a sudden I felt like I, I was moving into an area of doing something that I really wanted to do. Well, I'm also, you know, watching Joe move into what he obviously mm -hmm. really wants to do and, and, and is good at. So just just kept one foot in front of the other, <laughs> moving forward, learning as we go. And 
Well, let's talk about the space a little bit. The the the, the catalyst space, obviously, if not not a unique concept, but not 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 that common to have a shared tasting room space amongst a bunch of different brands like that. So, tell us about setting it up and about sort of getting it off the ground. Uh, it's unique for down there. There's nobody else is doing a collective tasting space down there. Um, yeah, I mean the 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 trickiest part about about doing it was navigating the legality of it. <laughs> uh, you know, OLCC does not make it easy. Um, but we, I mean, but all that being said, they were immensely helpful um, in kind of getting us where we needed to be and, and getting through that. Um, kind of the really cool part about it is that between, you know, Rob, Andy, and us, none of us are doing the same thing. Um, so, you know, Andy was more focused on kind of Rhone varietals and, and he, you know, introduced a Chen and Blanc as well. That's killer. Um, you know, we're doing kind of more Italian stuff with a little bit of Merlot and Riesling mixed in. And Rob's got his kind of more classic stuff, Chardonnay, Pinot, Franc, uh, Morved. Um, he does kind of different stuff every year. but. Um, but yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of, of intersection between the brands. And we all have, you know, kind of different vibes uh, as well. Um, but it all worked out kind of pretty well in a unified space like that. So how do you set up a space for that kind of ideal? Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's also, the, the space itself is unique for the area as well. There's not a whole lot of, um, not a whole lot of urban um, tasting rooms down there. There's a few. Um, so, you know, but also being a collective and being a, a newer build urban space um, definitely sets it apart. Uh, but it was a really great blank slate and um, it was really fun. I mean, I didn't do all the design myself. I am you know, had some help. Joe jumped in on that. <laughs> uh, but we built furniture, you know, all the guys helped out and we were really hands-on and, and uh, it, was, it was fun to create you know, a unique space for the area and also have a unique experience, um, which people generally really liked. They could come in and, in one spot without it being a wine bar, but um, kind of get that feel of a tasting room where you're really talking about the wine and where it came from and who made it. Um, a lot of emphasis on that, especially since there's, there were three producers um, when we started, so you really wanted to make sure that, you know, that information was, was out there and clear. Um, people understood who was making it, uh, where it came from, and, and why. So, so you got that experience in the tasting room, but also getting to try several different uh, styles of winemaking and, and lots of different varietals. So tell us about the, re the response then from the, kind of the, in the in what was the response from consumers and, and how has it grown? It was good, yeah, it was good. Um, it's, it's, still, it's still growing, it's, it's still good. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's the usual challenges of, you know, still being visible and, and being discovered uh, with new people coming to the area. Uh, and that's, that's been the biggest hurdle coming out of um, the pandemic, I think, is, is to stay visible <laughs> and on the maps. Um, but yeah, good reception. So Joe, I'm curious about sort of your winemaking style and sort of finding your winemaking style. So obviously you, you, ha you, you went from never having made wine before to being the winemaker pretty quickly. So tell me about synthesizing a style and how you would describe your wines today. Um, I mean, I'm generally looking for uh, brightness and freshness and, and doing more kind of food friendly wines. Um, a little lighter, a little more elegant, um, definitely very acid driven. Um, you know, I'm not, Shoot it, you know. I, I'm generally picking for lower alcohols as well. Um, you know, I mean, our Zinfandel the last two years, and part of this is due to red blotch, but I mean, they're 12, 12, 7 alcohol for Zinfandel. And I mean, they, they taste as full throated as, as anything else. That we're, I mean, it's 100% Zinfandel, so it's not like you're, you know, Rombauer or whatever, but like, it's, you know, that's generally kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and that's part of why. We love working with Italian stuff. Um, those tend to be a little, little, a little higher acid. You know, as far as finding that style, like that was just the style of stuff that I like to drink. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's super cliche, but every winemaker is going to say, "I'm just making the wine I want to drink." 
because um, if I can't sell it, then I'll just drink it myself. But I mean, it's super cliche, but it's true. Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of how I found it. Is just, you know, I found that pick a little on the earlier side. I mean, you know, always sampling, always sampling, always sampling, and the second those green flavors go away, I'm picking. Um, you know, I mean, I. I really don't care about sugar levels. I mean, I'm generally picking on flavor and pH. Um, and, uh, you know, in the cellar, generally I'm aging things in, in large format barrels. Um, again, to kind of keep that tension and freshness in the wines. Um, I think the only stuff we do in, in 60 gallon barrels is the Merlot. Um, and that's just what the wine wants. That's what we do. Um, but yeah, super hands off in the cellar. You know, bring the fruit in, crush it, and let it rip. Um, and that has served me well so far. Uh, you know, I like to use, we've, uh, at Barrel 42, we've got, you know, a few different, um, uh, let's call them alternative materials fermenters. Uh, we got some, uh, we got a con big concrete fermenter uh, that I'd made Dolcetto in last year and made Pinot Noir in this year. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, some Cacio Pesto Amphora, which is like basically what the ancient Romans used to build the aqueducts. Um, and that was, I love that thing. Um, we usually run Vermentino through that. So in terms of, uh, as you've added varietals, have there been sort of challenges with each new varietal you, you bring in, or is it, have you kind of started to find a rhythm for how to handle new things? Generally, I do my homework. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, let's say I'm making uh, Barbera, and you know, I'll go drink a bunch of Barbera and find a style that I like and look up how it's made and then try to copy that to the best of my ability and then kind of work back from there, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that's typically how that works. As homework goes, that's not, it's not too bad, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. Well, so tell me about the about the kind of the winemaking community there. You mentioned small. You mentioned people. You know a lot of people down there. So tell me about kind of finding the wine community in the Rogue Valley and, and how you've seen it sort of start to grow and change. Yeah, I mean it's a pretty pretty tight knit group. Um, I mean, we've got a pretty big tasting group down there with a bunch of a bunch of other winemakers. It's it's super fun. Um, you know, the wine scene down there is, is pretty varied. You know, there's a lot of kind of the more established uh, family vineyards that have been around forever. Um, you know, Troon, I mean, obviously they're under new ownership now, but I mean, they've been around since 72. Uh, the Wisnowski's out of Valley View, uh, the Weisingers, I mean, those are kind of like the established, you know, old heads. Um, and then you got you know, kind of more upscale guys like Irvine and Roberts and, and Danson and, and those kind of places. And then, you know, there's not a lot, but a few people like like us that are kind of bootstrapping and, and trying to figure it out. Um, like, you know, Rob he, uh, Folan, he's a winemaker of Bellafiore, but he's got his own little side brand, uh, Ryan Rose and, you know, Andy from Goldback. Um, pretty much nearly everybody that I work with at Barrel 42 has their own little little side label as well. Um, so yeah, it's just, there's a new wave coming up. That's pretty cool to see. What about on a consumer side? What are you seeing in terms of who's, who's buying your wines, who's coming by, and, and is that changing? I haven't been in the wine industry, especially front-facing in the tasting rooms long enough to really be able to have experienced any shift. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like I said, <laughs> I, I was the least experienced out of the group when we got going. And so, you know, I hopped on and I, I got a job at Quaddy North pouring in the tasting room for about six months before we opened our tasting room. Uh, and, then, and then I worked there. So it was, it was pretty kamikaze. Um, and, that, and that was during a pandemic. So again, <laughs> not your typical, you know, scenario. So really I came from being the consumer to then being, you know, the winery wine brand and, and behind the counter pouring. So it's, it's an odd perspective. I would say, 
I mean, what I drank and gravitated towards definitely changed. Um, I do think that people are getting um, more open to trying new things. I mean, I find that in the Rogue Valley, um, well, variety, there's a lot of variety, uh, varietals and variety in the varietals um, that are grown there just because a lot grows really well. And, uh, but you, you also do see a lot of um, grown varietals in the tasting rooms, um, which are fantastic and, and fantastic in that area. But, um, you know, we're experiencing, you know, people coming in and seeing some of the things that we're pouring and going, oh, what's that? And so just a willingness to try it and then realize that they like it and that, you know, there are more white wines than just Chardonnay and Viognier um, and Pinot Gris. So that's been, that's been fun to see, um, the adventurous side of the consumer mm -hmm. come out. Well, I know you have some exciting new news that we'll talk about in a second, but before we talk about that, I'm curious about the growth of the brand. Obviously, you mentioned you're growing in case size each year. You're adding new varietals each year. What are your kind of goals for where it's going to go next? And are there things you haven't made that you want to make? Are there things you want to try that you haven't tried yet? Oh, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, the list is so long. <laughs> it's It's... An unreasonable list. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so this year we were probably going to do about 900 cases. We did about 15 tons of fruit. Um, we, at our place, planted about half an acre of Alianico. Um, so the only Alianico in Southern Oregon. Um, somebody, I think, up in the gorge has some. Um, uh, so we're not the only Alianico in Oregon. Um, so yeah, we got that. Um, we made some Nero d'Avila this year from the Four Diamonds Vineyard. Um, uh, what else is new? We're doing a Rosé Primitivo. Uh, we got some Grenache as well. There's a lot of fruit out there this year. I mean, there was a point where I was getting a call, a couple of calls every day. Like, hey, you want a ton of cab? You want a ton of, like, I don't know where to put it. <laughs> I mean, yes, I, I would like to take that, but I, do not have a fermenter for it. Um, yeah, so we're about 900 cases this year, and then, I mean, I would probably like to max out at maybe 2,000, 2,500 cases, somewhere in that ballpark. I mean, that seems like a number that I can be like, hold up in my little cave and do by myself, as far as production goes. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as stuff that I want to see down there, and I've been like, fighting tooth and nail to get, um, I really want more Southern Italian whites, um, Fiano and Greco and Falangina. Um, so if anybody listening has some land, <laughs> let's talk. Um, we are gonna graft uh, the Riesling Vineyard over. Uh, so the Riesling Vineyard we originally um, uh, got our first vintages of Riesling from, we took over farming that in 2019 as well. So we take care of that vineyard. Uh, we just took over farming a little Pinot Noir vineyard this year as well uh, in Ashland. Um, but the Riesling vineyard, uh, we're going to graft over to uh, Rafasco and Rabola Gialla. Um, and the Pinot vineyard, we want to graft over to Fiano. If you can't so, get the fruit you want to work with, then... You commandeer vineyards and, <laughs> you and graft them over. <laughs> So tell me about with those kinds of varietals, obviously that's, those are not brand names. Those are not things that people necessarily are gonna recognize. So tell me about selling wines that are lesser known. You just put them in people's glasses. I mean, that's, there is a very special feeling when somebody comes into the tasting room and they're like, yeah, I only drink reds. It's like, wanna bet? <laughs> Pour them a taste of Vermentino, they're like, this is really good. It's like, see? <laughs> I told you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you don't have that, I guess, name cachet that, like, people know what Cab is, people know what Merlot is, people know what Pinot Noir is. Um, I mean, you know, Paul Giamatti ruined Merlot for everybody, but they still know what it is. Um, Everything, most of the things we're selling currently are hand sells anyway. Uh, Riesling, you know, a lot of people come in and think it's going to be sweet. Ours is not. Um, so, you know, you've got you've to talk about it. You've got to get it in the glass. Same with Merlot, has a bad reputation. 
Vermentino, not everyone knows what that is. Skin contact, not everybody knows what that is. Um, you know, a lot of people think that uh, all Zin is going to be boozy and jammy. Ours is not. You know, so so pretty much everything we're doing, we're already talking about it. Um, so it doesn't seem any different. You know, throwing something like Fiano into the mix, you're still going to get that. What is it? I'm not sure. You know, and sure. we'll try it and let me talk about it and tell you, you know, what we're doing with it. So it it's kind of the same um, to me. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you're not going to hand sell 2,500 cases of wine. Uh, so I kind of see where you're going with the question. Um, but I do think that there's, there's a more openness now to, to, to trying new stuff. And um, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily a younger drinkers thing or you know, older drinkers being sick of Cab and Merlot and Chardonnay. And, like wanting to venture out of the box a little bit. Um, but I do think, I mean, at least from where I'm at, I've seen a, a, a pretty good shift towards like an openness to different varietals. So hopefully that trend continues or amplifies. Excellent. So uh, in talking about selling wine, obviously you have some news to, to announce today, uh, today of all days. I'm so, so glad the interview was today. So tell us about what comes next for your uh, selling wine. Well, um, <clears throat> we are taking uh, the leap and next step and uh, moving on from Catalyst, which has been a wonderful little incubator um, and great space to start out and kind of launch our brand and, and get some visibility. But we are moving into our own winery and tasting room facility down the road. January 1st, so soon. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so we're leaving barrel 42, um, so I'm you know, kicking the paycheck to the curb. <laughs> and yeah, we're taking the leap. And you know, I, we kind of got to the point with Sound of Vision where like, you know, working 40, 60 hour weeks at my full-time job and you know, we're managing three vineyards now, and I mean, they're all small, but they're still three vineyards, and trying to sell wine and do our own thing, and I mean, I don't, it kind of got to the point where like, I, I don't think that Sound and Vision could be anything more than it is, mm -hmm. unless I'm able to dedicate 100% of my time to, to doing it. Uh, and you know, and Brian and Clea from Simple Machine, um, you know, they had just rebuilt their winery and then decided that they kind of wanted to pursue a different path. Um, and they'd been trying to get us to move in for a good two years now. And finally, we were able to be like, all right, it's the time. Like, we got to do it. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be it's a big leap, but it's going uh, to be a good one, I think. Um, so we'll have our winery and tasting room facility in the same, same location. And there's a pretty big outdoor space there as well. Um, you know, it'll be good for us to be there and like reestablish a connection with our, our customer base. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. This is in talent? It's in yeah. talent. Yeah. So tell us about the space a little bit. You mentioned that it's a pre-existing space. So tell me, tell, tell us what it's, what it's about and what you're excited about. Uh, I mean, it's basically a brand new building. Um, so Brian and Clea from Simple Machine, I mean, they lost their winery in the Alameda fire. Um, and then uh, rebuilt it and reopened um, and did the 21 vintage there. And then Brian decided that he uh, didn't want to make wine anymore and just pursue a different path. And yeah, so they had one, they made one vintage of wine there and it's, you know, they've been selling through their wine since. Um, but yeah, it's like, it, it's just a perfect size for what we want to do. It's a small um, scale winery, which doesn't you know, really exist many places you build it yourself. Yeah, exactly. Or? And, you know, a reasonable size tasting room and, a, you know, good outdoor, like, lawn space to, to sit down on. And, um, yeah, I think just the scale of it is, is awesome. It'll be perfect for what we're trying to do. And it's two miles away from our house. So with that, now with your own space, tell me what, in addition to, obviously, you mentioned sort of where the wine itself is headed. Where else... What else are you thinking about with the space in terms of events or in terms of 
what you're going to do with it? We are working on all kinds of ideas. Um, we'll see. I, I'm, I'm worried about putting too much out that making promises. Um, but we've, we've been brainstorming um, for a little while with, uh, with some fun things that we can do with the space that aren't just your typical um, winery experiences but uh, create a fun experience. It is still con an urban winery. It's not in the vines. It's right off the main drag, 99, between uh, Talent and Ashland. So, I mean, it's a, it's a great location. Um, but so we'll try to, we'll try to build in a, a nice little food experience and bring some fun um, other things to the mix. We'll be advertising heavily once those come <laughs> together it's still all in the works we're kind of hammering out the details and but we'd, we'd like to still um, even though we're not a collective tasting room anymore still kind of be community oriented and bring in other um, events with other winemakers and and things like that like we used to do uh, and have been doing at catalyst and really enjoy that so in addition to that, obviously a huge step. Uh, is there anything else that you're looking ahead to? Any kind of other sort of future plans or future excitement? Yeah, I mean, you know, like I just mentioned, just trying to commandeer more vineyards and get cool stuff in the ground, basically. <laughs> yeah. You know, now that I don't have a job anymore, I'll maybe have some time to take care of them. <laughs> right. I think fine tuning all of the many operations that we've already set up is going to be a goal um, and get stabilized and, and, and kind of make, hopefully make this thing. Come uh, on. Oh, come on. <laughs> Stability. Stability, on. I know, well, I mean, says the person Chaos. that is leaping off the cliff and taking the risks. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it'd be really nice to be able to dial in, you know, our farming and the varietals we're working with, and I mean, we're always going to be throwing lots of things into the mix. If Joe has anything to do with it, he is addicted to grapes, and he will buy as many as he can. <laughs> so, I mean, that's fun. I think next year's going to be another bumper year, so there's going to be a lot of fruit to buy. So hopefully people show up and <laughs> buy some of this wine. But yeah, we're looking forward to just having a little more breathing room to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. and. Um, connect, get back to that connection. And what about on a kind of a larger scale, uh, the future for the industry, especially in the Rogue Valley? What, what is going on with the industry now and, and what are you sort of excited about in, in, in talent and elsewhere? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of moving and shaking going on down there. I mean, you know, a lot of people from out of state coming in and starting to do stuff. I mean, you know, Calhoun just got well, not just, it's been a few years now, but Calhoun and Troon uh, just are under new ownership now. And, you know, it's kind of like I had mentioned, the, there's kind of the next wave of, of people kind of kind of starting to push up a little bit. So, um, you know, hopefully get some new, get some new voices in there and um, some, some cool stuff going on. All right, last question for you. Um, Proudest accomplishment so far? What is something you're, what is an achievement you're proud of? Oh my gosh, to narrow it down. <laughs> it can be more than one, that's fine. Proud accomplishment. I mean, just, just doing what we set out to do, I'd say. You know, taking that just little dream that we had, you know, while drinking wine with friends in Salt Lake City, and I'm constantly shocked that it's. How Six have, years later, we're moving around. How have we gotten where we are now? I mean, really, it has just been truly just saying yes to unique opportunities and then just taking that risk, not without a little bit of cautious overthinking to start mm -hmm. off with. Figure it out. But then eventually you just have to jump. Um, and, and we've been continuing to do that, and, and somehow, you know, we're still here. So <laughs> I guess it's been the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I guess not being belly up after six years is... That's a pretty good accomplishment. Pretty good. <laughs> I mean, six years is both a very long time and absolutely no time at all in the wine business. Right. Yeah, I mean, we're still new, but... When you launch your wine in February of 2020, it's, it's a long, it's a, it is a long time to be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've taken, yeah, the, a unique path and, and not the, you know, the easiest roads, for sure. Um, 
but I think that makes us more interesting. Builds I guess, character. I guess I will ask one more question at the end. Since so, I will ask. So you're in. Why are you in town this weekend? Uh, we're gonna do. Um, Eric from Ricochet organizes a little indie wine event. Um, actually, the one in the spring was a big indie wine event. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this one is at Mac Market tomorrow night. Um, I guess this won't be out for a little while, but uh, right. yeah, it's, it sounds it sounds really fun. It's uh, ten kind of small independent winemakers. I think everybody's under everybody's under a thousand cases or fifteen hundred cases or so. Um, yeah, it seems like it's gonna be. I mean, the first one that we've done with those guys, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be a fun event. And we'll be back up in December for. Uh, Jess Harris just pressed event. It sounds really, really fun. And then we're usually up in town for the All Wine Fest in the summer as well. Yeah, I think we're just honored to be in such incredible company, you know, to be invited to some of these events with, with some wineries we really, really look up to. So that's exciting. Excellent. Well, welcome. And, and congratulations on your big move and, and all the best. Uh, Anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? I think we, covered. I think we covered the basis. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, sharing your story with us. Uh, enjoying the end of this very sunny and beautiful day in the valley today. There you uh, go. We'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Excellent. Thanks, Rich. Thank you.